from the letter to the Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And from the Gospel according to John, chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. And from chapter 17. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a pleasure to be worshiping with you this morning and uh, undergoing a wonderful baptism experience with you. It's a hard act to follow what, what Maggie uh, had to say this morning. Her preaching was exemplary. The great and late Catholic monk Thomas Merton tells us that he had a mystical experience one day walking through the streets of Louisville around lunchtime. They were packed with people. And he ended up his description of this mystical experience with a question. He said, how is it possible to tell people we are all walking around shining like the sun? It's a very good question. Mystics ask very good questions. How is it possible to tell people we are all, all walking around shining like the sun? Well, one way to tell them is to recover what Teilhard de Chardin, the great Jesuit scientist and mystic, called the third nature of Christ. That is, the cosmic Christ. We've all heard of Jesus, the historical Jesus, the man who lived and taught and died for what he taught 2,000 years ago. We've all heard of Christ, of the Nicene Creed, the Christ that we call the Son of God, although that term, you must understand, is a very broad term. But few of us have heard of the cosmic Christ. In fact, Teilhard says, and he wrote this 60 years ago, that uh, he said, this third nature of Christ, neither human nor divine, but cosmic, 
has not noticeably attracted the explicit attention of the faithful or of theologians. So Teilhard was complaining over 60 years ago that this third nature of Christ has been essentially forgotten, has not been of interest to people. And yet the cosmic Christ is not an invention of the 20th century. In fact, it's in the letter to Colossians we read this morning. The Christ who holds all things together in heaven and on earth. That's rather interesting, I think. Joseph Sittler, a great Lutheran theologian, great renown, at the World Council of Churches in 1956 in New Delhi, lectured on that text, Colossians 1. And he said, what has happened to this Christ? The church began with this blaze of cosmic fire about the Christ who holds everything together in the heavens and the earth, and we've brought it down to a flicker in the pious little private soul of little individuals. We've turned the blaze of the good news into a tiny flicker of a flame. Now today, I think it's easier for us to recover the cosmic Christ for many reasons, not least of which is science. We now know that there are photons or light waves in every atom in the universe. And the cosmic Christ is the light in all things, as John 1 tells us. But when talking about the Christ, we're talking about the glory, the doxa, the Greek word in the New Testament is glory, for, is doxa for glory. It's the radiance, the burning light, the luminosity in every being in the universe. That's the cosmic Christ. Thierry de Chardin said this. He said, because it is not exalted by a sufficiently passionate admiration of the universe, our religion is becoming enfeebled. Our religion is becoming enfeebled because we've so succumbed to an anthropocentric, to a narcissistic, to use Pope Francis's term, view of the world, namely that it's all for us humans, that we're missing the great news and the great message of the cosmic Christ. Says Teilhard, the cosmos is fundamentally and primarily living. Christ through the incarnation is internal to the world, rooted in the world, even in the very heart of the tiniest atom. Nothing seems to be more vital from the point of view of human energy that the appearance and eventually the systematic cultivation of this cosmic sense. So if we want to bring energy back to the, the situation of apathy and couch potatoitis and passivity that characterizes so much of our culture, Teilhard is proposing that this experience of the cosmic Christ is what can wake us all up. Now we need to understand that the cosmic Christ is an archetype in the West, but there's a parallel archetype, several of them, in the East. The Buddha nature that the Buddhists talk about is an identical idea, that every being is a Buddha nature deserving of respect and of reverence, and indeed is a revelation of the divine, which is the teaching of the cosmic Christ. In the West, just recently, last year, a rabbi, a scholar, Rabbi David Seidenberg wrote an amazing book, a very important book, called uh, Kabbalah and Ecology, Kabbalah and Ecology. And it's about the image of God. In the Jewish tradition, he asked one question, because he tried to create a theology as a basis of ecology from his Jewish tradition. And the one question is this, are only humans images of God? Or is every creature an image of God according to the Jewish tradition? And he goes through all the Jewish history and teachings and he concludes every creature is an image of God. And I wrote him and said, David, this is exactly the teaching of the cosmic Christ in the Christian tradition. 
In Hinduism, there is this uh, teaching of the cosmic man, a primeval man, who existed before the beginning of the universe. Sounds like Colossians 1 to me. Who was sacrificed by survive, but survived his own dismemberment. Sounds a little bit like the crucifixion to me. This, cos this cosmic man represented the order of the universe in tension with the chaos of the universe. Sounds a little bit like the Logos that we hear about in John 1. And also in the Hindu tradition, a recent saint, Swami Vivekananda, said, the moment I have realized God sitting in the temple of every human body, the moment I stand in reverence before every human being and see God in that person, that moment I am free from bondage, everything that binds vanishes, and I am free. So we're talking here about a universal archetype that all human hearts yearn for. And really, all the traditions of the world have tried to answer. Now, I wrote a book a number of years ago on the cosmic Christ called The Coming of the Cosmic Christ. And several years ago, a woman came up to me after I was giving a talk, and she said, I want to tell you I just loved your book on the cosmic Christ. She said, it totally changed my understanding of Christianity and it totally changed my life. I liked it so much, I read it twice. But she said, I have one question. I said, what is that? She said, what's the cosmic Christ? <laughs> every, every author should have that experience once in their life. Not twice, just once. But I've meditated on that for about 12 years, that encounter. And actually I realized, hey, I, I'll take, thank you, I'll take it as a compliment. Why? Because the cosmic Christ is an experience. It's a mystical experience. And this you cannot put into a definition. There is no one definition for the cosmic Christ. Because the left brain achieves definitions. But the right brain, the mystical brain, experiences. And so while I wrote a book that she read twice, with 300 pages, talking about the cosmic Christ, I realized uh, that there are poets who have named the cosmic Christ in one page. And I'm speaking at this point of Mary Oliver, a New England poet of our time and mystic, in her marvelous poem called At the River Clarion. At the River Clarion, she writes, I don't know who God is exactly. So right off the bat, she's talking theology, but unlike a lot of theologians, she's humble. She doesn't know who God is exactly. But I'll tell you this. So she's going to tell us a story, kind of like Jesus taught. I was sitting in the river named Clarion. Notice, in the river, not by the river, near the river, in the river, on a water-splashed stone. And all afternoon I listened to the voices of the river talking. Whenever the river struck the stone, it had something to say and the water itself, and even the mosses training under the water, and slowly, very slowly, it became clear to me what they were saying. Said the river, I am part of holiness. And I too, said the stone, and I too whispered the moss beneath the water. That, my friends, is the cosmic Christ talking. That's the Logos. That's the word of God. Every creature is part of holiness. She goes on. I've been to the river before a few times. Don't blame the river, but nothing happened quickly. You don't hear such voices in an hour or a day. You don't hear them at all if selfhood has stuffed your ears. And it's difficult to hear anything anyway through all the traffic and ambition. If God exists, he isn't just churches and mathematics. He's the forest. He's the desert. He's the ice caps that are dying. He's a ghetto and the Museum of Fine Arts. He's Van Gogh and Allen Ginsberg and Robert Motherwell. He's the many desperate hands cleaning and preparing their weapons. 
He's every one of us, potentially, the leaf of grass, the genius, the politician, the poet. And if this is true, isn't it something very important? If this is true, the cosmic Christ, isn't it something very important? Isn't this the basis of a new leap of human consciousness? Isn't this a revolution, this new paradigm of seeing the cosmic Christ in oneself and in all beings? This will shift our actions and attitudes toward Mother Earth, toward her forests, toward the elephants, toward the polar bears, the whales, the rivers, the soil, all of which is disappearing right under our noses. This will get us out of our couches to be the defenders of Mother Earth, the green men and the green women that our times demand of us. David Bohm, the physicist, shortly before he died, said, I am a postmodern physicist who begins with a whole, W-H-O-L-E. The modern age was about parts. The postmodern age is about the whole. And this is why the cosmic Christ is a paradigm for our time and a revolution for Christianity to renew itself, for other religious traditions to renew themselves and to come together around this ancient archetype of the sacredness of all beings, the inherent divinity in all things, the cosmic Christ in all things. In the Gospel reading from John, we all know that Jesus did not go around saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. This is the Christ talking. This is the creative invention of those who came after Jesus, putting all these words in Jesus' mouth. Scholars today, as you know, tell us only about 15 or 20 percent of the words that we ascribe to Jesus in the Gospels are really his words. The rest was the exuberance of the turned on community. Where did all that exuberance go? Why aren't we being so creative today? They, they fudge the lines between themselves and Jesus, and that is appropriate because all of us are other Christs. So it was the Christ talking who said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And that beautiful passage we read is full of panentheism, Christological panentheism. I am in you, you are in me. That's how we have to begin to rethink our place in the world. All beings are in the grace of divinity and the grace of divinity is in all beings. We are all mirrors of the one face of God. <clears throat> and so the I am sayings themselves, I am the vine, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, all of these are cosmic Christ sayings because I am is the name of the divine according to the book of Exodus. When we can say these things, in what way are you a vine to yourself and to others? In what way are you a door to yourself and to others? In what way are you a good shepherd? That is the Christ in you talking. That's becoming adult spiritually and not projecting on a, on a dead Jesus, but recovering the sense of the resurrected Christ in all of us. That's the call of adulthood. And in fact, <clears throat> it was Jesus himself in Matthew 25 who, from his own lips, from the lips of the historical Jesus, talked about the cosmic Christ, instructed us about the real meaning of the cosmic Christ when he said, when you do it to the least, you do it to me. When you feed the hungry, you are feeding me. When you clothe the naked, you are clothing me. When you visit the prisoner, you are visiting me. He saw himself as more than Jesus. He was present in all other beings, especially those in need. And so are we. That's the meaning of compassion. As Meister Eckhart, the great 14th century mystic, put it, he said, what happens to another 
whether it be a joy or a sorrow, happens to me. That is the real meaning of the cosmic Christ experience. It is very intimate and personal on the one hand, but it is also very cosmic and global on the other. What happens to us happens to others. What happens to others happens to us. We are one. We are the one Christ together. The Christ is not just the light in all beings, it is also the wounds in all beings. And that is the power of the archetypal event of the crucifixion, which, if you reread all the gospel stories, is set in all of them as a cosmic event, not a private, psychological, personal event of Jesus and, and me on the cross, but a cosmic event. We're told in one gospel that the veil of, veil of the temple was rent in two when Jesus died on the cross. But we now know that the, the front veil of the temple was in fact a painting of the universe. That was rent in two. In other words, the whole cosmos was split by the injustice of the assassination of this one man by the empire of his day that he dared to confront with the teaching of justice and compassion. So there is so much that spills out that gets re-understood and reawakened and reignited when we begin to take in this deep and profound teaching, this ancient teaching, because Paul's epistles are earlier than the Gospels, earlier than the Gospels, and he's talking constantly, not just in Colossians, but in Philippians, and in the school of Ephesians, and other places, about the cosmic Christ. Perhaps we were not ready until the third century to make this shift, and to really gather in with the help of science what is really implicit in this profound teaching and with the help of the other world traditions which we really were quite unfamiliar with until this time in history. What an amazing moment to be alive when the cosmic Christ is returning. Science supports it and the needs are so profound the needs call for all hands on deck. All hands on deck to confront the ecocide, the killing of Mother Earth and her beautiful children, the crucifixion, yes. Mother Earth is a cosmic Christ, therefore we are crucifying the Christ all over again when we destroy rainforests and polar bears and elephants <clears throat> and water systems and the soil and the air and all the rest. So we have to get over the sentimentalism of being pious about Jesus on a cross 2,000 years ago and get on with the task, all hands on deck, the task of recovering a sense of the sacred, of recovering the experience of knowing that all beings are walking around shining like the sun. Amen. May the cosmic Christ, the blaze of doxa and glory that dwells in all of us and in all beings, come alive, stand up strong, to work for healing and justice making, incarnate compassion, bring joy, delight, and thanksgiving to all we come in contact with. May this happen through the gift of Mother Father, our Creator, of Jesus, our Liberator, and of Holy Spirit, who works still in creating and recreating the world, rendering all of it new again. Amen.